dear Heavenly Father, you said they that call upon your name yeah, yeah. shall be saved. Mm -hmm. And we call upon you this morning, oh God. Mm -hmm. Father God, we need you in all of our lives, yeah, yeah. in every situation, mm -hmm. all circumstances. Mm -hmm. right. When we're in trouble, mm -hmm. when we need healing, yes. when we need deliverance, yes. you're the God of the universe. Yes. You know our ups and you know our downs. Father, we come before thee this morning and acknowledge you as being Lord and Savior, deliverer, fortress, shield and buckler, a will and another will. You're the anointed one, the appointed one, the holy one of Israel. Father, we don't know nothing but to do is but to call upon your name. Yes. Father, we love you so much. Yes. We miss coming to church and being with our family and friends. Yes. Father, we thank you that we were able to come out this morning yes. to acknowledge you as being our Lord. Yes. Father God, have your way in this service today. Yes. Bless the speaker, bless the yes. musicians, and bless the singers. Yes. But especially, Lord, bless your people all over the world because we all need you, Lord. Yes. And we thank you for this day. Thank you. In Jesus' name, yeah. amen. amen. It's an old familiar hymn. You probably sang it a long time ago or you heard it just recently. The song is, Oh How I Love Jesus. And in Jesus Love is here. In it. <laughs> Aren't you glad about it? Last time that we officially met, we tried to wrestle with the side of God that's not always sweet and enjoyable. 
And hopefully we find out that we don't always serve a God who shows mercy and forgives and comforts and consoles. But we also serve a God who sometimes acts in mysterious ways and unexplained means. And a God who sometimes does what we don't like and what we don't ask for. And a God that we can't always understand. Now I want to encourage all of us that when we read our Bibles, and it seems like God is acting in a way that is contrary and opposing to his character. That we don't just skip over those verses and ignore those sections. Because the same God that we see in those verses and those sections is the same God that we're going to meet and get to know in the chapters of our lives. And all of us are going to have to learn to relate and to deal with a God who can leave us with more questions than answers. And a God who acts in ways that are always pleasing and always pleasant and always pleasurable in our lives. And I try to tell y'all all the time that my goal isn't to answer why God does what he does. Because none of us can answer why God does what he does. Because God is so sovereign that in his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are beyond our thoughts. So I can't answer for God. I can't defend God. I can't justify God. Because God is sovereign and God will do what he chooses to do. Yeah, and we won't understand all of God Sorry. until we sit in the throne room of God and see things a whole lot clearer. But my goal every Sunday and this Sunday is to help you develop a faith and a belief that can endure and withstand the mysteries of God. And that we learn to trust God even when we don't understand God. And that we have a commitment and devotion to worship God that doesn't demand that the Lord makes sense, but we can worship him anyway. And I want all of us to become like the disciples in John chapter 6. Because in John chapter 6, Jesus goes deep, goes into the deep end of his theology. And he teaches some things that are hard and difficult to understand. And the Bible says there are some who were following Jesus. And when they couldn't understand what Jesus was saying, that they decided to walk away. Because they couldn't understand everything about Jesus. So then Jesus looks at the twelve. And he asked them, do y'all want to walk away and y'all want to leave me too? And Peter steps up and this is what Peter says. Lord, I don't understand everything that you're saying, but to whom shall we go? So I don't know everything that you're trying to teach me, but where else can I anchor my faith? I don't get everything that you're doing in my life, but where am I going to go if I don't have you? And I'm praying that all of us become like these disciples who can admit that I may not understand everything about God. But where else am I going to go? Because I don't get everything that God is doing in my life. But I can't give up on him right now. I don't know why God does what he does. But my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I'm anchored in the Lord. And I don't always understand. And today I want to invite us to another troubling picture of the God that we serve. And it's going to shock you and surprise you because of the Sunday school faith that you have in God. And it comes up from 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 14 through 23. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 14 through 23. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing, distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master not command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that he will play with you with his hand when a distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. So Saul said to his servant, Provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillfully in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, 
and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took the donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them by his son David to Saul. So David came to Saul and stood before him. And he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Then Saul said to Jesse, saying, please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And so it was whenever the spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. Let's look at verse 14 again. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. I want to use for a subject. It takes a good fall to know where you stand. It takes a good fall to know where you stand. Most of us are familiar with the circumstance and the situation that sets the background for 1 Samuel chapter 16. Because Saul, the first king of Israel, has been rejected by the Lord because of his repeated acts of disobedience and rebellion. And having rejected and denied Saul, the Lord has another king in the making who is the youngest son of a man named Jesse in Bethlehem by the name of David. And the Lord commissions the prophet Samuel to go to Bethlehem. And in a secret action, in a hush-hush effort to anoint David as the next king of Israel, even though Saul has been rejected by the Lord, but Saul is still on the throne. And at the end of the anointing of David in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13 tells us that Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And if we keep reading the verse 14, we're going to find out at the same time that the spirit of the Lord has come upon David. Then verse 14 tells us that the spirit of the Lord that was in Saul has now departed from Saul. Now I can stop right there and preach another sermon to question the stability of the Holy Ghost in our lives. And I can preach for a good 15 minutes about the Holy Ghost in the New Testament and the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament. But that's another sermon. And it's not the departure of the Spirit of the Lord from Saul that messed with me, because that was standard and normal in the Old Testament. But y'all, what stressed me about this text is that verse 14 doesn't end by saying that the Spirit of the Lord just left Saul, but there's a conjunction there, there's a junction there, and there's a function there that hooks up two things. Because not only do we find out that the Spirit of the Lord has left Saul, but verse 14 also teaches us that a distressing spirit from the Lord troubles Saul. And maybe y'all read by that too fast because the spirit of the Lord leaves Saul, but a distressing spirit from the Lord troubles Saul. And y'all, that word distressing means that it was painful. It means that it was sad. It means that it was troubling. King James calls it an evil spirit. New King James calls it a distressing spirit. The Message Bible calls it a black mood. And what all those verses seem to suggest is that an evil spirit and a distressing spirit and a dark spirit from God is sent to torment and trouble Saul. And maybe y'all are okay with that. And maybe your faith can handle that. But y'all, it scares me and it worries me because that's not the God that I grew up with. Because I learned early in Bible reading in Genesis that everything that God makes and everything that God creates is always good. So y'all, how can a good God send an evil spirit? And some of y'all are already saying that God can use pain, and God can use problems, and God can use trials. And y'all, I know all that. But those things by themselves are always evil and always wicked. Because that word wicked and that word distressing speak against the holiness and the goodness of God. And what we see is a holy and a good God using something that is contrary and opposing to who God is. So how do we bring together holiness and evil? Because how can a holy God and a loving God and a gracious God and a merciful God and a God who we say is good all the time right. release an issue of evil and distressing spirit to trouble and torment his servant Saul? 
Because y'all, it just seems to me that God's authority and God's power over the world should dismiss or rule out any evil and any wickedness in the world. Because if God is almighty and God can do whatever he wants to do, isn't God mighty enough and isn't God great enough to keep all evil away from me? But here we have the image of an almighty God who doesn't just allow evil, but he uses evil. And how can a holy God be responsible for evil? Now, I didn't come to shout y'all this morning. And I restricted it in my own understanding to give us the answer as to how God can allow evil. But I will tell you that these verses that we're dealing with have at least two issues that are neglected and overlooked in the church. So two things that come out of this that we need to deal with, but we chose not to. And this may be one of the deepest sermons that I'll preach all year. But hopefully that's why you come and log on to progress. Because we don't come here to holler and to turn over the chairs every Sunday. But sometimes we need to think about some things. And the first thing these verses force us to deal with is the existence and the reality of mental illness. Because when we look at Saul, we find out that Saul wasn't the king that he could be for two reasons. Because number one, he constantly disobeyed the Lord. Number two, he's jealous and envious of David. And number three, Saul is affected and disabled by a mental disorder. And Saul is one of the first people in the Bible that we meet that has a mental illness. Because if you read your Bible, you'll find some strange things that indicate that something isn't right in his emotional and his mental health. Because Saul acts in some ways that are unreasonable and unnecessary. Because when it's time for him to be anointed the king, he's so scared that he hides behind his suitcases and his luggage. Another time he wanted to kill his son John just for having a honey sandwich. Another time he throws spears and javelins at David when David is playing instruments for him. Another time he calls on medias and witches to get dead people to talk to him. And eventually Saul commits suicide. And y'all, when theologians and scholars look at the life of Saul, they identify a man who has some clear signs of mental illness. And they diagnose him with anxiety disorder, with panic attacks, with severe depression, with paranoid schizophrenia. And they have determined that he's borderline bipolar. Wow. So y'all, here's the king of Israel who sits at the highest level of the land, who has wealth and riches at his disposal, but he's dealing with a mental illness. And that's a reminder to all of us that there's nothing that we can put on our resumes that can shield and shelter us from mental and emotional illnesses that can affect any of us. Because mental illness doesn't discriminate based on age or color or status of education. Because all of us in here can be exposed to some kind of mental illness. And I believe that we meet Saul today so we can lift the shame and the label that's connected to mental illness in three ways. Because number one, we have to define and explain mental illness the right way. Because when we hear mental illness, somebody other than you drops in your mind. Because when we think about mental illness, we think about somebody who needs to be medicated. Somebody who needs to be in a straitjacket. Somebody that you know is crazy. Somebody that we define as pathetic and weak. Because strong people don't need to be medicated and go to the therapist. Because strong people just deal with it. But mental illness is not just about having paranoid schizophrenia and being bipolar and being severely depressed and having suicidal thoughts. Because there's some other areas of mental illness, like situational depression. Because if any of y'all ever been sad, if any of y'all have ever had anxiety and been nervous, because yeah. you've been worried and nervous about something, yeah. any of y'all ever have lost sleep that night, worried about what tomorrow is going to bring, have you ever found yourself in the dumps of life, wondering why you just don't have the joy that you used to? Are you mute, moody and do you have mood swings? Well, if you can say amen to any of that, you might have a mental illness that needs to be dealt with. And one of the things that we need to embrace it is that in every church and in every seat, that there's somebody who's wrestling with somebody with something that's causing anxiety. And that's destroying their joy. And that's keeping them up at night. And that puts a knot in their stomach. And has them confused and don't know which way to go. And that doesn't mean that they're crazy. That doesn't mean that they're weak. That doesn't mean that they're pitiful. But it means that they're human. Because all of us wrestle with some mental illness at some point in our lives. But, we, but, not, but not only do we have to lift the label of mental illness by redefining and understanding that it's more widespread than we think. 
But the text also suggests to us that we should encourage the use of mental health professionals. Because Saul has a discretion in the tormenting spirit that is causing his mental illness. And the people around him say, look, Saul, you need somebody to help you. And you need somebody who can play, play the heart and soothe the distress that's in your spirit. And Saul has enough wisdom and enough insight to say, find me somebody who can help me with this spirit that is tormenting me. And the Bible says that God is preparing a young brother by the name of David. And verse 18 gives us his resume. And his resume says that he's skillful in playing the heart. He's a mighty man of valor. He's a man of war. He's prudent in his speech. He's a handsome brother. And the Lord is with him. So the Lord is with him. And the Lord has given him with what he needs in order for him to help solve what's distressing him. And when David plays and uses this gift, the spirit that distresses Saul leads and goes away from Saul. And in a real sense, David becomes Saul's therapist. Because David uses the gift that God has given him to help Saul with the evil spirit that he's dealing with. And I want to suggest to us in the same way that God has called some Davids into our lives who were skilled and called by the Lord and trained by the Lord and used by the Lord to help us with the mental illness that sometimes can torment us. And there's nothing wrong with seeking out a date. Uh -huh. Now let me tell y'all why y'all neighbor is quiet. Because the last time that we see Saul before this is in chapter 15. And he's repenting on a Sunday morning. He's worshiping on a Sunday morning. He's praying on a Sunday morning. So don't miss this. Because Saul is repenting. Saul is worshiping. Saul is praying. Saul is repenting. Saul is worshiping. Saul is praying. But he still knows that he needs a date. Because the misconception of our faith is that we believe that whatever our struggle, that we ought to just pray about it. Get up. Push our way through. And that ought to relieve everything. But y'all, I'm a witness this morning that you can repent every day. You can worship every day. You can pray every day. Read your Bible every other day. Come to church every Sunday. And you're still going to need a date who is skilled by the Lord to help you with the spirit that is tormenting your life. Because you can have a Bible and a counselor. You can pray and have a psychiatrist. You can worship and still lay it out on somebody's couch. Because everybody needs a date. And there's nothing wrong with your faith if you're struggling with your mental health. And I already know that most of us can't accept that. Because we call ourselves Christians. And Christians are supposed to be depressed. Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I'm supposed to have joy all the time. But not only am I a Christian, but I'm a man. And men don't get the praise. And not only am I a Christian and a man, but I'm a black man. And black folk don't get the praise. Not, so not only do we have to define mental health the right way, and not only should we encourage the use of therapists and counselors, but the text also teaches us that we should be compassionate with people with disorders and with diseases and with disabilities. Because when we look at the life of Saul, we'll find out that over and over again that he tried to kill David. Because we read in chapter 18 and chapter 19, Saul is tormented again by the same spirit from God. And David starts to play his instruments to try to help Saul. Saul grabs some spears and chases David around the room to try to kill him and nail him to the wall. But y'all, what got me is that David never tries to kill Saul. Because there were plenty of times when David had Saul all by himself. And he could have killed him and nobody would know. But David never tried to kill Saul. And maybe one of the reasons is that David knew for himself that Saul had a mental illness. And he refused to try to harm somebody that he knew had an illness. And he was compassionate with somebody with a disability. So I now want to put a charge out to all of us. For us to be more compassionate and more considerate for people with mental illnesses and disorders, and for them to have a place where they are welcome and can grow and can worship the Lord, a place where everybody can come see the gospel, a place where somebody with HIV and AIDS can come and not be afraid that you won't pass the beach to them, a place where somebody who is struggling with an addiction can still be accepted as a child of God, a place where families with an autistic child can come and not be embarrassed to be in the house of God because that child is different. And that we learn to speak with compassion and concern. And that we don't diagnose people by their problems. But we accept them as people who just may have a problem. 
Because we don't call them an autistic child. Because that puts their problem above their person. But we call them a child with autism. Because the person is more important than condition. But y'all, not only do we need to define mental health the right way. Not only should we encourage the use of therapists and counselors. Not only should we be compassionate about disordered diseases and disabilities. But we also have to learn how to understand the relationship to God's relationship to evil. Because how do we account for God sending an evil spirit to Saul? And I know that nobody but Deacon Allen is going to tell the truth. But those words bother me. Because it was an evil spirit from the Lord. Because it seems to me that God and evil shouldn't be able to exist at the same time. Because a holy God shouldn't be responsible for evil. And y'all, it's connected to a, dip, a deeper issue in our theology. And that issue is called theodicy. And theodicy is how we justify and explain and defend the image of a loving and an almighty God, but still have to deal with the hate and the evil in the world. So how can you claim that God loves and that God can do anything, but you still have to deal with the evil at the hands of a loving and almighty God? And I need to make sure that we see the issue here, because how can a loving God allow evil? And how can an almighty God not stop the evil before the evil gets into our lives? And all of us in here have had a theodicy moment where we went through some evil and we suffered a tragedy. And we had a pain that left us wondering, how could God allow me to go through this? Because if God can do what he wants to do, and if the Lord said that he loves me, shouldn't he have kept this from happening to me? And y'all, that's the same reason that all of us know somebody who stands outside with their faith with God. Because they couldn't, they can't, uh, can't account for God and evil. And since they know that evil is, is real, and they know that their tragedy hurt, and they know that their pain was obvious, they walked away from their faith in God because they couldn't understand how God and evil, God and evil, can exist at the same time. But here we are in verse 14, and it's a dispensing spirit from the Lord. So y'all, how do we account for God and evil? Well, some scholars believe that biblical authors and writers wrote the Bible from the standpoint where there were no secondary causes. So those who wrote the Bible looked at the world as not having any secondary causes. So biblical writers wrote from the standpoint that all roads lead back to God and that whatever happens in the world was a part of the will and the plan and the purpose of God and that God is responsible for everything. So when it rained in the Old Testament, Bible writers didn't believe that it rained because certain weather conditions were made. But they believed that it rained because the Lord said let it rain. So Israel lost the battle. Bible writers didn't believe that they lost because of their weapons or their strategy. But they believed that they lost because the Lord let them lose. So if somebody got sick in the Bible, it wasn't because of a bad diet or a lack of exercise or not having access to good health care. But Bible writers believed that they got sick because the Lord said be sick. So y'all, if a tragedy happened, it only happened because the Lord said tragedy. If somebody died, it wasn't because of cancer. It wasn't because of COVID. It wasn't because of a disease. But it was because God called them home. So the viewpoint of biblical rights was that the Lord was responsible and accountable for everything. Now, y'all, the good news is that that was their viewpoint and their position. But in 2022, and as a child of God, you have a right to your own viewpoint and your own position. Because you have the right to see the events in your life in a different way than the writers of the Bible saw the events of their day. And one of the biggest decisions that you have to make to establish the foundation of your faith is where do you stand in the conflict between God's providence and our free will. So all of us have to decide if the events of our lives are governed by God's providence or guided by our own free will. Because on one side, there's a preordained plan and purpose of God. But on the other side, it's the gift of humanity and free will. So on one side, it's the plan of God and the predestination of God. And the argument that everything happens is according to the predetermined purpose of God. But on the other side, it's the thought and the belief that my free will choices determine where I go in life. So how much of your life do you believe is predetermined and predestined? And how much of it is shaped by your own decisions and your own choices? How much of your life do you believe is based on what God said is going to happen? And how much is it by your own choices? So, for example, the clothes that you have on right now, 
Was that your choice? Or did the Lord already predetermine that that's what you were going to wear? And how much of your life is under the, your, own, your own choice? And I want to suggest to us this morning that where we stand between God's problems and our free will determines and establishes how we see evil in the world. Amen. So if a child is outside playing in the street and around the, co the corner becomes a drunk driver that's out of control, and the drunk driver takes the life of a child, but the drunk driver is still alive, and you're the preacher at the funeral, so where do you stand between God's providence and your own free will? And because evil is happening, some of us to say that it was the will of God, and we might not like it, we might not accept it, we might not want it, but God handled this and God did this. And y'all, that may sound cruel to somebody, but that's exactly what we say when we use these slogans and these sayings, when we tell somebody that God knows what's best, because we're saying that God is responsible. When we say that God won't put more on you than you can bear, because we're saying that that was the will of God. When we say that we don't question God, we're saying that the death of that child was the plan and the purpose of God. Or some of y'all will be on the free will side, and you would say that this wasn't the Lord, but this was a decision and a choice. Because somebody chose to drink and to get drunk, and then they chose to drive. And his choices led to killing an innocent child. But what you're also saying, is that, God, that all God did was sit back and let it all happen. Now let me admit to y'all right now that I have some trouble with both of those positions. Because I have trouble with the position that it was the will of God to take the life of an innocent child. Because that's not the image of the God that I want. And that's not the theology that holds me together. And that's not the kind of God that's helping me in my life. Because I don't like to make God responsible for evil in the world. But y'all on the other side, I can't worship a God who I believe is almighty and unconcerned. And a God who just lets evil go down and says, I'm sorry. Now, I can't tell y'all where to stand. And I can't tell y'all what to believe. I can't tell y'all what to think. But there's enough scripture to, to support both. That we'll be crazy when we leave than when we came in. And we can't find one scripture that makes it all easy. And all I can do is share with you my position. All I can do is what tell you what holds me together. All I can do is share with you what my thoughts are. And not only for, not for you to have my position and to believe what I believe, but just to share with you how I reconcile God and evil in my own life. And I believe, first of all, that the Lord has a plan for my life and that God has a desire for every decision and every choice that I make and for every detail of my life that God has a plan will of what he wants me to do. And y'all, I believe that nothing happens in my life that God is unconcerned about because God cares so much about me that he even cares what street I live on. He cares about who I allow in my life. He cares about where I spend my money. And I believe that God has a plan for what color socks that I even put on today. Because God says in Jeremiah 29 that I know the thoughts that I think towards you. But y'all, I also believe that God has created us with free will and the ability to choose. Because free will is what makes us different than anything else that God has created. Because trees don't choose. Animals don't choose. But they just do what comes natural to them. But God has given us the ability to decide what we want to do. And y'all, God gave us a decision because he created us to worship him. And our worship has more value when it's a decision and not a command. Because there's a difference between being forced to come to church and choosing to come to church. So God gives us a choice. So when we worship him, there's some love and compassion connected to it that is different than we're forced and pushed to do. And it's almost like you want your boo, your veil, your spouse to love you because they chose you above everybody else. Not because you're the only one they could get because there's more value in my love when I know that you turn him down to have me. And the choices that make up our world are for better or for worse. So y'all, the Lord brings Adam the animals in the garden. Yeah. And he tells Adam to name all of them. But he doesn't tell Adam what to name. But he says to use your free will yeah. and choose what their names would be. Uh -huh. So when God brings Adam a bear, we don't know if it was God's will for it to be called a bear. But that's what Adam named. Uh -huh. And that's what it became in the world. Yeah. By, by Adam's choice uh, controlling and governing what the world he was in. Yeah. And we can use our choice to line up with God's will. Or we can choose to disobey God's will. 
We can choose to be what God has planned for us. Or we can choose to live our lives in our own terms. Now, y'all, just the other day, I was driving from Bladen County to Durham County. And because I had never gone from E-Town to Durham before, I had to put my GPS to get there. So I'm following my GPS to get to Durham. But my GPS didn't know that the exit on the highway had already changed. So my GPS was telling me to get off in 500 feet. But y'all, I chose to keep on going. And when I noticed I had passed my exit, I decided I'm just going to turn around in the next exit, only to find out that there wasn't the next exit. So now I had to go 14 more miles down the road before I could turn around and come back to where I was supposed to get off. Because some choices that we make have to play themselves out to take us out of the way before we can come back to where we should have been in the first place. So I believe in God's predestined plan. I believe that I have free will. And I believe that there's real presence of evil in the world. And y'all, it's an evil that shows up in the book of Job. It says that I've been going to and fro on the earth. It's an evil that Peter says walks like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's an evil that Jesus says comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. It's an evil that approaches Eve in the garden of Eve and tries to lure her away from God's plan and God's purpose. Because evil is the consequence and the outcome as a gift of our free will. So y'all, the natural outcome of being able to choose means that we choose against the will of God. And every time that we make a decision that takes us outside of the will of God, that evil in the world is expanded and enhanced. Because evil grows in every simple decision that we make. Which means that all of us in here are inherited the world. That becomes more evil with every generation. And all of us can be affected by the evil that we were born into. That doesn't come from a result of a wrong decision that we made. Because just look around at us now. Look at our environment. And how the decisions have weakened and ruined the earth that God has given us. Look at how babies are now being born into the world. Filled with toxins and viruses that we can't even see. And that evil imposes itself on us, even when it's not our choice. So if a person who's never smoked get lung cancer and dies, do we say that that's the will of God? Because we can't say that it was their choice, because they never smoked. Or do we acknowledge this is evil in the world that gets worse and imposes itself on us? Because in my belief, every evil that goes down is not the will of God. And it's not the responsibility of God. But y'all, since I've been preaching this morning, I can't give y'all a bad diagnosis of send y'all home. So I have to give y'all some good news. And the good news comes in two words. And I need y'all to get ready to write these words down. Because when evil has shown up in the world, and evil has shown up in your life, and tragedy knocks on your door, and we have to go through something that doesn't make any sense to you, I need y'all to remember these two words, but God. Now don't miss y'all shout, but God. Because God doesn't just sit back and say, oh, well, too bad. But God doesn't just let it happen and say, I'm not going to do anything about it. Because we serve a God who is so mighty and so powerful that he can take what was meant for evil and work it out for our good. And just like our GPS redirects us when we go wrong, so does our God. And that's why I don't hold the Lord responsible for evil. And I do believe that God corrects evil. I don't believe that God causes evil. But I do believe that God fixes evil. Because God can take what was dead wrong and redirect it to make it right. So he can take the death of a child by a jump drop and give the parents the path and the design to create an organization called Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Because God is able to step in the middle of evil and tragedy and work it for our good. Because that's what he did for Saul. Because notice that Saul was tormented. And that the Lord had a plan named David to fix it. Now let me tell y'all what blessed me. And I hope that my real Bible readers have already seen this. Because verse 19 tells us that Saul sent message to Jesse and said, send me your son David. And y'all, this is the first time in the Bible that David's name is used. Because before this, he was just the son of Jesse. And we never know his name. So God, y'all, God uses a man who is troubled by evil to introduce us to the one who was going to reign over Israel. So God allows Eva to introduce David and to invite David into the throne room where David gets a glimpse of a future coming attraction. Because God always has a way of taking what was meant for evil and using it for our good. 
So don't you give up when evil is at your door. But let God do what he does. Because God has a way of turning evil into good. That's why Acts tells us that the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt, but God was with him. That's why Paul tells us that I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the growth. That's why Roman tells us, but God shows his love for in us while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us. Because anybody can bring good out of good. But y'all, it takes an almighty God and a powerful God who can take our mistakes and our messes and work it together for our good and his glory. And that's the God that I serve. So where do you stand in God's providence and free will? It's going to help you decide how you handle evil. And I pray that you have a faith that can do some evil experiences. God bless y'all.